Now, I'd like in this uh, message this afternoon to speak a little bit on a healthy mind uh, from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Now, I'm from Canada, but I don't think we're that much different than the U.S. in this respect. There's been a lot of uh, um, mentioning in journals and articles and in the general media about the challenges that the COVID pandemic has brought in terms of its impacts on mental health. And as Christians, we're not exempt from that. And certainly there are probably more people, not probably, there are, more people who are struggling with um, uh, depression, with anxiety, and with just a general sense of stress and worry as a result of circumstances over the last 18 months. Now, I can't claim today uh, to deal with that in any way from a medical standpoint. I know there are actual medical uh, underlying realities that some individuals have, so I don't want anything I say today to be construed that I think I'm providing answers for those that need medical help. If you need professional help and counseling or medical help for the impact that that has had on you and your circumstances, then please seek for it. But I think what I'd like to try to do is acknowledge that the world in which we live and the circumstances that we currently face, they do have an impact on our minds. And they do have an impact on our general uh, state of wellness in terms of our thought life and our minds. So what I'd like to do in this epistle, as I mentioned at the beginning uh, message, the mind is one of the themes that runs through these four chapters. And for those of you who maybe have never studied the book of Philippians in much depth, I would encourage you to do that. Again, print it out, four chapters, or get it on a tablet or something that you can highlight. Go through the four chapters and highlight every time mind or mindful is mentioned, and every time that verbs are mentioned that have to do with using your mind. So thinking, counting, reckoning, any words that have to do forgetting, words that have to do with the exercise of your mental faculty, highlight them. And then as you read through those, you'll get a general sense of what the epistle is telling us, what the letter is telling us regarding our minds. Now, our mind, what is our mind biblically? Well, man has, some have argued, and uh, it amazes me the things we can find to argue about. Some argue whether man is a bipartite or a tripartite being. So do we have, a, that is, do we consist of two parts? Like, do we have a part that's sort of the material, physical part of us, our body, and then a part that's immaterial, and uh, we're only really two parts? And then some say, no, we're actually three parts. We're, we're body, soul, and spirit. And so we have a body that's physical, and then we have a soul that is the inanimate part of us that uh, holds our feelings and our personality, and then we have a spirit which is that part of us that makes us God-conscious and interfaces with God. I'm not sure, to be honest, how much of that is semantics, how much of it is just people that love to argue. In this whole mix, you'll find words in the Bible like soul, spirit, heart, mind. So the mind is definitely part of that uh, part of us. It's not my body. It's not just my brain. Some may have better brains than others or bigger brains than others. Some may use greater proportions of their brains than others. But your mind is more than just the physical gray matter. I was in the other day to get uh, my ear cleaned out. It got plugged up and they went to uh, clean it out. And I asked the lady who was doing it, I think the nurse or whatever, in the doctor's office, the clinic. I asked, what did she see? She said, I see right out the other side. <laughs> I thought that was not very compassionate or caring of her. But at least, you know, she was honest. Our mind, W.E. Vine defines it like this. He says, when we read about our mind in the Bible, mind denotes, speaking generally, the seat of reflective consciousness comprising the faculties of perception, understanding, and those of feeling, judging, and determining. So you put all of that together under W.E. Vine's definition, you'll have an idea what we're talking about when we're considering a healthy mind. Now I'm going to move quickly. So I'm going to talk about six elements or six attributes of a healthy mind as we see it in this letter. First of all, we read in Philippians 2 and verse 3, likely the best known reference to the mind in the epistle. Philippians 2 and verse 3, 
Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The first attribute of a healthy mind for a Christian is a mind that is marked by humility and serving others, not by self-interest. Now, Sandy has alluded to this. I don't know that there has ever been an age like the one we're in right now that is so obsessed with self. Everything about my reality, the way that our world and our society, especially in Western culture, views it, is to be measured by how it impacts me. And so if I want to know how is my mental health, well, it's how do I feel. If I want to know who am I, well, it's who do I think I am. If I want to know what's my identity, it's, well, how do I express myself? And if I dig deep enough inside myself, I will get answers to all of these existential questions, most of which are going to be determined subjectively by how I feel. Now, this is not at all a political uh, message today, nor is it a sociological message. It's a scriptural message to say that the message of the New Testament is crystal clear. If I dig deep enough in myself, I will not find truth. If I'm searching for identity, I won't find it in here. And if I want to know how I'm supposed to function, where should my mind focus, you have to find a solid anchor point outside of yourself. Otherwise, you're just adrift. And the Bible makes it crystal clear. There are two things. I spoke on this at Cleveland for any of the young ones that were there. There's two things that never change, that are outside of me, that are always the same. They're objective. They're absolute. God and the Word of God. And if I want answers... I can go to God because he'll always be the same. No matter how I feel, no matter who I think I am, no matter if I'm happy or sad, rich or poor, it makes no difference. Whether you go or I go or we all go, God is God. And he has chosen to reveal himself in his word. Isn't it interesting that in Acts chapter 20, when Paul calls for the Ephesian elders, and those leaders of the assembly in Ephesus come and they meet with Paul, as he finishes speaking to them, what does he say? I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. So when it comes to this issue of my mind, the first point I would make is this. We must be marked by minds that are not absorbed with ourselves, that are not just looking out for our own interests, that are not absolutely preoccupied with how am I doing and what do I need and how am I feeling? All of that vocabulary has crept in even to Christian circles. You know, we talk about me time. I need me time. I have to look after myself first. Now, I know that we need to relax. We need to refresh. We need to be healthy. We need all of those things. But very often, some of these labels are just very flimsy little masks to cover self-obsession. A Christian is a person, according to Philippians chapter 2, whose mind is to be marked by lowliness, whose mind is to be focused on the interests of others, more so than my own interests. And you will find that to the extent that my mind is focused on the needs of others and praying that the Lord might use me as a conduit for their blessing to help them, it will actually result in me being in a much better frame of mind. It's just the way it works. So the first thing I'd suggest, a mind that is marked by humility and serving others, not self-interest. And the standard for that is the Lord Jesus himself. And that's the section where Paul goes on to say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Just one thing on that section, and I can't really go into it, but in what way are we supposed to model ourselves after the example that Paul gives here in chapter 2? And I do find it interesting that in chapter 1, Paul uses himself as an example. He says, for to me to live is Christ. Chapter 3, he uses himself as an example. Actually, literally, he says, that they're to, to follow him. 
And he, and he talks about his past life and how he counted it all loss and he presses to the mark and toward presses forward towards the mark and so on. He uses himself as an example. Chapter 4, he uses himself as an example. And he talks about learning. In whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But on this subject of selfless service and focus on others, he only uses Christ as an example. And then he uses Timothy, and then he uses Epaphroditus as human examples. But he leaves himself out. He really did practice what he preached, the Apostle Paul. The Lord Jesus is our example, I'd suggest, in two ways. The first section of that passage dealing with the Lord Jesus speaks about things that were legitimately His. Being in the form of God, thinking it not something to be grasped at or clung to, to be equal with God. He made Himself of no reputation by taking to Himself the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. It's speaking about something which was legitimately His. Without question, it was His. But he willingly laid aside what was legitimately his and took the form of a servant for the benefit of others. I'd suggest to you that that's one area where we struggle. We can give, but what if it actually takes something which is legitimately mine? Is there not a little voice that goes off in your head? You ever, maybe, maybe I'm too honest, but you know, sometimes you try to help somebody. And you're helping them and you give them something and, you know, financially you help them and you go out for a meal with them and you're trying to, to work with them and you're trying to... And then it comes to something that you had really planned all week to do. And you get a text message and they really need you. And again, maybe I'm too honest. Do you just ignore the text message? Do you just say, no, this is, you know, come on, this is my time. This is, this is my family. There was one who legitimately held the highest place in heaven. And he didn't pause to set it aside for the service of others. But you know the other area where we really struggle is after we've already given a lot, we think we've done enough, just as I've described there. And yet that passage goes on to say that even after humbling himself, by, after emptying himself, by taking to himself the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men, even then... We could never measure how much he gave up. But even then, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient all the way to death. The, the model for selflessness in my mind is the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I want a healthy mind, the first thing is not to focus on how I feel and how I'm affected. and The first thing is to focus on Christ. And to recognize that I am called to selfless service for others. But number two, I touched on this this morning. I'll just reference them and we'll move on. A healthy mind, according to Philippians, is a mind that is marked by unity and not division. And just for those who weren't here, if you look at chapter 1, verse 27, dealing with the subject of unity, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. When you come to chapter 2 and verse 2 on exactly the same subject, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love being of one accord, of one mind. And when you come to chapter 4 and verse 2, the two sisters who were not getting along, he beseeches, verse 2 of chapter 4, Eudeus and I beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So the second attribute of a healthy mind in the book of Philippians, number one, a selfless mind focused on others, not self-interest. Number two, a mind that is marked by unity, not division. Don't be an argumentative person. Don't be a person. Sandy was talking earlier. I hope that when you walk into a conversation whether that's socially in a Christian's home or even into a meeting, I hope that as you walk in, there's a breath of fresh air comes into the room. I mean nothing about your body odor. I mean your attitude as you come in. It's like, oh, you know, Paul describes someone as the, the bowels of the saints are oft refreshed by thee, brother. Do you have a refreshing impact when you walk in? Or are you the type of person that when you enter into a room, you have so many chips on your shoulder, you look like McDonald's super fries. 
And as you come in, everyone walks on eggshells. And everyone's afraid, oh, what's he going to bring up now? And oh, it's going to be something else. Don't be like that. Be a Christian who is focused on unity. And unless there's some compelling reason to upset the apple cart, just enjoy the apples. And, and work together with what is. Don't try to be a disruptor. In the world today, it's, it's valued. It, it's promoted. It's, it's trendy. It's sensational. To come up with new things and lob trial grenades and just see how you can upset things. That might be good for talk shows. And it might be good for social media or even podcasts. It's destructive in an assembly. So in an assembly, a believer should be marked having a mind that is marked by unity, not by division. Number three, look with me at chapter three. Now in chapter three, you're not going to see the word mind used until near the end of the chapter. But I want to look with you here at a mind that is marked by commitment to divine service, not self-indulgence. Okay, so if in chapter 2 it was self-obsession, it's looking not to my own interest but the interest of others. In chapter 3, it's a mind that is marked by commitment to divine service, not self-indulgence. So let's look at chapter 3 and verse 7. And I want you to notice a few words as we go through here. Look for the word count. Look for the word apprehend. Look for the word forgetting, and then look for the word thus-minded. Verse 7, what things were gained to me, Paul says concerning his last life, those, his past life, those I counted lost for Christ. Counted is a word of the exercise of the mind. In other words, Paul weighed it up. He considered it. He got to a point in his life where he said, what matters to me? What do I value? What are the things I live for? What are the measures that give me a sense of fulfillment and purpose? The things that were gained to me. Came a point in his life where he reckoned it all up and he had a radical change in his perspective and how he viewed those things. He said, the things that were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. That is an exercise of the mind. Yea, doubtless, and I count. So this is not now a point in his past life where he counted all things but loss. He says, no, it's still present. It's still current. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, refuse, garbage, nothing. They matter nothing. I count them but done that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend. Now that is more than just a word of the mind, but it includes the mind. Paul's saying, if by any means I might lay hold of the purpose for which Christ laid hold of me. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. So here we have a mind that is marked by commitment to divine service. Paul sets a very high standard in this letter. Chapter 1, he says, for to me to live is Christ. Oh, such a common, common verse. It's a staggering verse in terms of its claims on me as an individual. I can't say it. Sandy says he can't sing some things truthfully. I can't say that truthfully. I come to chapter 3 and Paul says, I count all things but loss. I can't say that truly. I would to God I could say it to a greater degree. Are there things in your life, dear brother or sister, and things in mine? It could be relationships, it could be possessions, it could be pursuits and habits, it, it could be a number of things that are hindrances to the purposes of God being fulfilled. You see here in chapter 3 a man who counted. He focused his mind and weighed it up, and he came to a conclusion, and he says it's all nothing compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ, 
and seeing the purpose for which he apprehended me fulfilled in my life. So a healthy mind is a mind that is marked by commitment to divine service, not self-indulgence. Again, it flies right in the face of everything that we are bombarded with every day. Everything about our culture today says that mental health will be found by indulging myself. And the Bible, cutting right across it, says a healthy mind will be a mind that is focused on Christ and serving others. Number four. In this same chapter, chapter 3, verse 19, he's speaking now about false teachers, people who are going to come. He says, Many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping. They're enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, I just want to, I'm not going to go into great depth on this, but I just want to focus your attention on that little expression, who mind earthly things. I think the ESV translation says they set their mind or they have minds set on earthly things. A healthy mind is a mind that is marked by focus and discipline, not scattered or cluttered or careless. Let me just quote to you. I don't have time to turn to them, but I'll quote to you three times in the New Testament where we have this construction. Minds that are set. Set your mind on something. The first is in Mark chapter 8, verse 33. The Lord Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and Peter says to him, far be it from thee, Lord. He turns to Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You notice the contrast? Setting your mind on the things of God, or setting your mind on the things of man. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So in the first Mark passage, we have set your mind on the things of man or set your mind on the things of God. Romans chapter five, Romans chapter 8, sorry, verse 5, set your mind on the things of the flesh or set your mind on the things of the spirit. Colossians chapter 3, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In 1 Peter, we read that we are to gird up the loins of our minds, or the ESV says to prepare our minds for action. Could I just suggest to you, and I don't want to labor this and I don't want to come across as a negative Nelly, but one of the great dangers facing us in terms of our minds as believers is not just the quality of the information we're allowing in, or the lack of quality, but the sheer quantity of information that we allow in. And we do not gird up and discipline and focus and constrain and set our minds. If we are going to be the people that God intends us to be, we are going to have to learn the discipline of focusing our minds, setting our minds on the things of God, setting our minds on the things of the Spirit, Setting our minds on things that are above, not on things in the earth. And one of the dangers we face today is the sheer volume of information, sensory input. How do things get into our minds? Well, things get into our minds through our senses, through what we see, through what we hear, through what we touch and feel and experience, and I suppose to some degree through what we smell and what we taste. But definitely what we see and what we hear and what we experience. All of that feeds biologically through our nerves back into our brain and gets processed. But in terms of the functioning of our mind and our mental faculty, it's all coming in. And there's never been a generation like there is now in 2021 that has had more stuff coming in. One of the greatest enemies to your mental well-being and mind is this, a smartphone, a tablet computer. Now, I'm not raging against technology. It's just a tool. 
But what I am saying is that the volume of information we allow in, is it truly focusing our minds on the things of God? Is it truly focusing our minds on the things that are above? Is it truly focusing our minds on the things of the Spirit? Or is it doing exactly the opposite? Let me just throw some examples out. And I'm going to try to be, you know, broad-based, not just my pet hobby horses. Sports. Not just young men, young women too. Sports fans. When I was young, I sound like an old fogey, when I was young, if you were interested in sports, you woke up in the morning and you got a newspaper and you opened up the newspaper and you went to the sports pages and you looked to see what happened last night. Right? I mean, it sounds archaic. They didn't really know what happened until the next morning. But it's sort of the way it was. If you were really interested in sports, there was a page at the back of the sports section that had statistics. And you could look at the standings and you could look at, you know, two or three select statistics. Nowadays, I have one son in particular to my youngest son, and he's heard me say this directly to him, not speaking behind his back. I tell him, I said, David, like the 99.9% of the stuff that you pay attention to is absolutely pointless. Your phone vibrates every 13 seconds of the afternoon to tell you the latest stats. Somebody just scored a touchdown. Somebody just hit a home run. Somebody on your fantasy team just did such and such. Now, I'm not saying it's all worldly and it's evil. That's not my point. My point is not that those things are absolutely off limits for a Christian. I'm just saying it's a tremendous amount of information coming into your mind. Does it serve to set your mind on the things of God, the things of the Spirit, the things that are above? Social media, the vast majority, the, if you're honest, the vast majority of what you watch on TikTok, of what you scroll through on Instagram, of what you go through on Snapchat, does it really enrich meaningful relationships and involvement in the lives of other believers for whom you're a conduit of blessing? Or is the vast majority, the vast majority of it trivial information at best, if not damaging information at worst? Lest anybody thinks I'm just picking on young people and social media people, what about business? What about investment reports? What about stock market performance? What about, and the list goes on. We have become these creatures that crave constant stimulation. Even when we get downtime, we have to fill it with something. And most of what we fill it with is information that does not promote focused minds that are set on the things of God. So I would just appeal to you. As I said, I'm not raging. I'm not finding fault. I'm not trying to be drastic. I'm appealing to you. Would you be willing, if the Lord doesn't come this week, would you be willing to just take from Monday morning, take stock of the information that you are willingly allowing into your consciousness and ask the Lord to show you, are there places where you can simply cut back? Maybe it's the number of people you follow. Maybe it's the number of feeds you have. Maybe it's whole channels of things that you don't need to know. Are you willing to cut back on the amount of information that you're allowing into your consciousness that is not furthering the work of God in your life? I'll ask myself the same. Because I think that a mind that is healthy is a mind that is marked by focus and discipline, not a mind that's scattered or cluttered or careless. Two I'll just mention and then close in prayer. Number five, Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. A healthy mind is a mind that is marked by purity not defilement. It's not enough to just, in fact, I'd suggest to you that our focus shouldn't just be on trying to stop damaging things coming into our minds, or even as I've just said, stop the volume of things coming into our minds. There's actually a principle of displacement. There's the idea of focusing my mind on things that are wholesome, using my mind to think of things that are worthwhile and profitable, things that are true things that are just, 
things that are of good report. Again, I'll say it, don't be a person who's up to date on every controversy, who's got a mind that is filled with all that's wrong. Don't engage in group discussions where you walk in a room and all you hear is tearing down. Don't do that. Focus your mind on things that are good and wholesome and pure, things that are profitable, things that are excellent, things that are worthy of praise. Think. That's a positive, deliberate choice to determine that you will think on those things. Finally, in verse 6 and 7 of Philippians chapter 4, be careful for nothing or don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The final attribute I would say from the epistle to Philippians for a healthy mind is a mind that is marked by peace, not anxiety. Now, I don't have time to spend any, uh, go into any details on this, but I would just point this out. If you're a person, as I am, that struggles at times with being anxious and knots in your stomach and... Um, and COVID's brought that to a lot of people, or not the disease itself, but the conditions during the pandemic. I like the way this verse doesn't just say, don't be anxious about anything. That's all it said. It's pretty hollow. The worst thing you can say to a person who's feeling anxious is don't be anxious, right? Because then they just feel more anxious about feeling anxious. And, you know, they shouldn't feel anxious, so now they're anxious about why they're feeling anxious. And it becomes this very vicious cycle. And That's not meant to be funny. It's true. The verse doesn't just say, don't be anxious about anything. There's a but. It says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Now just look at those three things. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. Prayer is just a general term for communicating with God. Supplication is a much stronger word. It's like a subset of prayer. Supplication has the idea of anxiously earnestly, determinedly laying hold of God and pleading. Prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So this is telling us that the peace of God will keep our minds if when we are anxious, we take that into the presence of God. Don't try to carry it on my own. Take it into the presence of God. Communicate with Him in prayer. Plead with Him in supplication about whatever it is that's causing my anxiety and even about the fact of my anxiety itself. If I can't explain it, sometimes we get overcome with a sense of anxiety and, and worry when we know it doesn't even make sense. But we're just upset and we're worried about it. Take that. Take it to Him in supplication. But as you're doing it, do it with thanksgiving. And from the message I had this morning, find reasons to give God thanks. And if you can't find any reason in your current circumstance to give Him thanks for that circumstance, maybe the secret is to get your mind off that circumstance and get your mind on Him and get your mind on eternity and get your mind on things that are above and get your mind on the Spirit of God. All those areas where we are to set our minds and you will find that you have ample reason and so do I to be thankful in God's presence. So I hope that this, it's rushed, it's hurried, but I hope it'll be a little bit of help to us. I would encourage you to go back through the epistle on your own time. And as I've suggested, look for references to the mind. Look for verbs, as we have, that, that talk about the focusing of the mind or the exercise, the use of the mind. And you can put a little more flesh on the skeleton that I've given you. A healthy mind will be marked by humility and serving others, not by self-interest. It'll be a mind that is marked by unity, not division. A mind that is marked by commitment to divine service, not self-indulgence. A mind that is marked by focus and discipline, not scattered or cluttered or careless. A mind that is marked by purity, not defilement. And a mind that is marked by peace, not anxiety.